this week we met the Dark Prince himself, Slanesh, god of desire, excess, and indulgence. We also explored how Slanesh came to be imprisoned in the pocket realm of Olghish, where a number of elven gods pull the broken and traumatized souls of their old world kin from him. And while that drama and his plots to escape are fascinating, it is centuries in the making, and his forces still sweep across the realms devoid of their patron god. His demons still have form, and he still has his home in the realm of chaos. But how do his children and disciples respond to an absentee god? In this drama that is Age of Sigmar of gods fighting for and molding the souls of mortals, what does a faction look like when theirs is ripped away? And that is the subject of today's video, known as the Hosts of Slanesh. These are the three broad categories of how the followers of Slanesh respond to their absent god. What's more, the Battle Tome even created rules for each host as a way of exploring that reaction on the tabletop. It's an awesome idea and I want more of it. Now, the followers of Slanesh generally have responded to his absence in one of three ways. And we call these the invaders, the pretenders, and the god seekers. And so let's dive into them. Before I do that though, one important note that I want to put up front is that even some of the hosts favor specific units and leaders. Any host can be made of any Slanesh units and still be lore friendly. These are not meant to be restrictions, they're generalities. With that said, let's look at the invaders, far and away the largest of the hosts. The invaders seem to carry on the will of Slanesh even after his disappearance, considering themselves traditionalist in some sense. These are the massive roving war bands of Slanesh that plague the realms in the stories that we've read. They seek battle for the intense, sensational experiences it can provide. So those feelings of danger and slaughter, pain from injuries, ecstasy of victory, or the fear of defeat, those are all intense internal sensations, but there are, of course, audio thrills of musicians and screams and war cry and weapon clashing and the visual extremes of blood splatter and expert blademanship, all that stuff. There's just a lot of sensation to experience in a battle. And the followers of this host want to taste every single bit of it. To the point where even death is just one more experience to feel and be exhilarated by. Now, given their disposition towards combat and, and moving right into the fight, they don't typically hold land. They always want to be invading, to crash hard into an enemy. And so when they do sweep through an area, they slaughter everyone there, but then they also build these grisly trophies and marks of victory. They'll take body parts of their victims and lay it out in artistic patterns, and they'll paint murals with blood, sculptures from the dead, all this stuff. They basically come to an area totally despoil it, make it disgusting, a gruesome horror show, and then move along. And there are many of these war bands and they range in size. When they bump into one another, it can either be war or they can partner up. So it could be one devouring the other and growing to a bigger one, or they can just work together. And if they do work together, they see their conquest as a competition between the leaders. And so in this way, invader armies can have multiple quote unquote generals or leaders and they're all fighting to prove supremacy, to drive their followers into the greatest act of debauchery and sensory pleasure. They are typically led by a keeper of secrets, and they just exude the will of Slanesh and are the pinnacle of what the invaders seek. This kind of deadliness, beauty, speed, and thrill all in one. Next up are the pretenders. If the invaders are carrying on if Slanesh's absence doesn't change a thing, the pretenders are using this time as an opportunity. These are followers of Slanesh that see his empty throne as one to be usurped, to assert themselves along the other dark gods and become a deity, because the leaders of this host truly do see themselves as gods in waiting, which means it's a nearly unthinkable level of ego. To believe yourself a god, and to think that you can play at the level of Korn, Nurgle, and Zinch. It's an army of egomaniacs who think that they are something great. And so they do this by hosting grand parades as they leave devastated cities. There's lots of mirrors to reflect their glorious leader. And there's this crazed level of devotion to their warlord. 
Truly, they pretend to be great enough to earn Slaanesh's throne, hence the name. They assert themselves as deity. When two of these war bands meet, they can't both exist, right? You can't have two people both saying that they are rightful heirs to Slaanesh's throne, and so they'll have to clash, likely one absorbing the other. And while this one might seem very far-fetched, there is some logic to it, because if you think about on a warband level, right, if your warlord dies, someone then challenges for control. Someone says, I should be the leader, and then someone can challenge it or not. And why would Slaanesh be any different if that's how he organizes his troops down below him? Why can't someone try and take that crown from Slaanesh? And so that logic is there, but it breaks down pretty fast when you consider the vast difference between the god and a mortal. Something that their ego doesn't allow them to ponder. But beyond that, they go around doing Slaaneshi things. They're just totally focused on this singular leader who they believe to be a deity in the making. And last up are the God Seekers. And the last host and response to the missing Slaanesh problem are the God Seekers. The name obviously implies that they are desperately seeking their God. It's kind of this weird holy mission for the least holy faction. And it's at the forefront of their minds and actions. But there's a lot more going on here than just the guys looking for Slaanesh. Because they're not just searching for him, they're hunting for him. I make that distinction between searching and hunting because everything about this host is geared towards locating, stalking, and striking down prey. They pursue enemy wizards, nobles, scholars, anyone who might have a clue to finding knowledge, artifacts, or records of Slaanesh. Their mutations, the actual mutations of chaos that happen to every one of their troops, reflect this, making them better hunters. They get larger ears, flaring nostrils, wide eyes, morphed into a form that allows them to pick up the faintest of trails and see in the darkest of lights. They are born and bred hunters. And it's important to note that even though these are the god seekers, the one who want to restore Slaanesh to his glory, they're not just doing this out of the kindness of their hearts. The keepers of secrets leading these hosts believe that Slaanesh is alive and can be found and released, and the one who does so will attain the highest honor of being his favorite. Kind of like how, you know, Zinch has Kairos Fate Weaver. They want that, but for Slaanesh. They don't have this delusion of grandeur like the pretenders. They don't think that they can be Slaanesh, but they see freeing him as an avenue to the highest level that they can achieve. Now, we know that this is ultimately flawed. Slaanesh gives and takes his favor on a whim for seemingly no reason. But if they do understand that, they don't entertain those thoughts whatsoever. He is not a god who expresses gratitude. So those are the hosts. So why are they so cool? Well, I'm really into big events having ramifications and getting a chance to see reactions amongst characters. If a story has great characters, it's fun to see how they respond to events, and this is no different. The event is that Slaanesh has gone missing. So how do these massive warbands and armies respond? And so, like we said, it's generally one of three ways. You carry on, you try to fill the void of power, or you go looking for him. And those are fantastic motivations. I can instantly understand why they would all do X, or I can understand any one of those. The Pretenders is probably the hardest one for me because of the level of ego involved. But on the whole, you can easily construct motivations for why each of these armies would be involved in a given conflict. One of the criticisms I had immediately after the events of Soul Wars and that box set dropping was that aside from endless spells, there didn't seem to be a lot of repercussions to what Nagash has done. Now, note that that has changed with all these newer battle tomes adding post, you know, Necroquake lore. My point here is that in this one book, I feel the event, the absence of Slaanesh, and I, just as these warlords, see how it's happening and I get to choose to respond. It's all in one. I feel like there's an event and instant ramifications that we can play out. And when I say play out, I mean they actually have in-game rules for each of these hosts on how they conduct themselves within a given army. As a narrative guy, I'm all about the God Seekers, mutated into the perfect hunter and predator, constantly looking for clues and some trail to follow. Right? Every legend they hear might be a hint, every artifact a clue, I think all that's just really fun. But what are your thoughts? What host resonates with you the most? 
tell me in the comments down below. And hey, if you are enjoying Slanesh Week, please consider becoming a subscriber and click that little bell notification so you get alerted whenever I release a new video. Tomorrow, we're going to start diving into the actual units within the book. There's not a ton of them, so I'm basically going to split it into heroes and non-heroes. But we'll kick it off with the leaders of ecstasy, the hero section of the Heed Knights of Slanesh book. Thank you all so much for watching, and happy wargaming.